de un computer audio and let's see what it was. Yes, okay. Oh, no, 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 no. no, no. Just minimize it. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, okay. And now let's see here. Um, we have to adjust. Oh, everything is set. Mm -hmm. There was something else to do here. There was the top one. Oh, uh, hmm. you remember you took a couple of pictures. I did. I thought it was just the top. This is okay. One. This is right. Uh, this is the right way. Echo canceling speaker. Press the Intel display audio. Everything is okay here. We just need. Uh, it's very there is anything yeah. one step more. I don't okay. remember which one. Let's see. Uh, maybe oh, like this. Let's see. Um, um, no, <laughs> uh, but we can try once we start uh, the the zoom with. Uh, but this is okay. This is okay. There's a speaker and microphone list. Okay, it works. Hello? No. Let me suppose that. The first option, the first option. No, I know. It's yes, both are working. Okay, we will be able to hear very hear very well. Yes. Can you hear me? Me pueden escuchar? Sí, sí pueden. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, yes. Uh, no, this is just for oh. the audio in the classroom. Okay. But we have okay. to raise the volume. We need to raise the volume, which is here. Is our guest here? No yet. yet. No yet. Volume up. Mm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just want to start to check if everything is working okay with the audio. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I'll turn it around. It gets very sound. I wonder if it would stay. Oh, okay, let's see if we can check. Yeah. We can see what might even sit in here. I'll try last week. Yeah, that's actually. No, no that's it. Right. Mm. Yes. Mm. Behind it to prop it. Yes. But first, it's not full or not. Yeah. But not too bad. Yep. Don't you want to be in com on camera? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe there. Yeah, so he can. <laughs> um, I I'll you... show him that he has a nice view. Yes. We still have lots I am of going time. to be here. Okay. <laughs> and maybe you can be there. Okay. Okay. So he can see you. That's the problem. I don't know what happened. That, it uh, that camera only works with Echo, no with Zoom. Yeah, those ones, there's plenty because you can actually hold it in different directions. Yes, but it doesn't work with. Okay. Mm. Well, that would be, I hope 
people listening to Tom and they will see. Yes. Yes. Well, maybe I will. See. They are not shy. It would be great if a camera over. Yeah. It would be. Yes, it would be great if yeah. the camera were there. Yes, it would. Yeah. So. Um, I think that the the
Can you hear us? Uh oh. He's on mute. Are you on mute? Good afternoon, hey. Professor. Bring it down a bit. We can... How's everybody doing? Lower the volume. Good. Everybody is says they're doing well. There are we we're gonna probably have um I would say another 15 or so, 10 to 15 join us. So okay. I'll give you a little look around the room. There are uh we've got 50 students enrolled in the class, and so they're spread kind of around, and you're just I think they're all just trying to avoid being in the center of the room. How are you? Good, thank you. Good, you're at home. Yep. Um, not a teaching day for you? Right, Thursday is the only day I, I do not teach in, in, at school. So, well, we are the beneficiaries of your schedule then. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, it worked out perfectly. Yeah, good. Well, we've done the reading, we've discussed the readings. So Great. We are, our minds are primed for this. Excellent. Uh, we'll just wait another couple minutes. Anything okay. else you want to say? I'm getting before? my um, my PowerPoint ready and all that. Okay. Yeah, we should make sure that we give you can you share? Do you see share screen capability or do we have to assign you that? There you go. What, you see it? Yep, no. No, no. Okay, hold on one sec. Um, okay. I am allowing him to share it. Okay. Is it done? Did you put it in place? Yeah. Uh, you should be able to share your screen. Yep. And then you, yep, here we go. That's his screen. Yes, it, it is automatically. It says so, doesn't it, at the top? It did yes. earlier. It's recording. Yes. Great. Yes. So, you can take notes, of course, but also we are recording. Okay, so don't feel like you have to capture everything on the slide. Professor Forsetter, are you willing to share your slides with us? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so you will share them. I will put them on Blackboard. Don't spend time when you can be kind of engaged mentally trying to write down everything. Okay, don't worry about that. All right, well, technically, it is 116, Professor Matthew Forstad from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, who was, if I'm not mistaken, a student of both Bob Heilbronner and Will Milbert. So the readings that were assigned that we discussed on Tuesday, he is intimately familiar with both of those scholars. And it is my pleasure to welcome him and so grateful to you for doing this. So take it away. Thank you so much, Professor Kelton, and uh, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, Professor Kelton and I have known each other, worked together uh, for 25 years, Professor. Um, I was thinking about it today so I could make these remarks. So, uh, I mean, you are extremely fortunate to be able to study with Dr. Kelton. Uh, I'm sure you know all about her, uh, but uh, I just want to, you know, make that uh, very clear because sometimes, you know, when I was in school, a semester could get away from you or you know, life happens as a pandemic or, and um, just, you know, you don't want to waste the opportunity. So um, great, great topic for this class, uh, ideology and capitalism. There's so many different things you could talk about. And 
it being early in the semester, I think we're kind of setting up some of the background for the later debates. Um, so I wanted to start with this quote. Um, I don't know if this might be on the syllabus, but uh, it it's a very well-known uh, book by Albert O. Hirschman, who spent his career at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, which is you know where Einstein was. And if you saw the uh, movie, A Beautiful Mind, Nash uh, was there and you know many, uh, so Hirschman was there for you know, many, many years. He only recently passed on. Um, so his book, The Passions and the Interests, addresses this question. How did commercial banking and similar money-making pursuits become honorable at some point in the modern age after having stood condemned or despised as greed, love of lucre and avarice for centuries past. So, I mean, this is one of the things that we you know, need to try to understand because you know, prior to the 17th century, let's say, um, things like, uh, jacking up prices, you know, selling something for more than its just price, um, or um, profit activity, basically, those activities related to the market were considered immoral, or sometimes were even illegal. In England, many laws had to be passed in order for capitalism to uh, emerge out of feudalism. So uh, how then uh, could it be that these activities, which had been associated with some of the uh, more negative potentials of human nature, transform into virtues so that selfishness basically uh, became a virtue. So we'll, we'll um, keep this in mind as, you know, we're talking about the various uh, historical and and theoretical issues. And so why am, okay. So as far as definitions of ideology, um, Raymond Williams in his excellent book, Marxism and Literature, he uh, talks about three common definitions a system of beliefs characteristic of a particular class or group, a system of illusory beliefs, false ideas or false consciousness, which can be contrasted with true or scientific knowledge. And then third, the general process of the production of meanings and ideas. So really interesting, uh, I thought when I uh, read this years ago. And uh, so number two, which is maybe the most common conception of ideology that gives ideology, this number two, uh, a kind of negative connotation, uh, that is, you know, often associated with Marx, um, although the, the, you may have, this may have 
come up uh, already, but uh, I guess it was uh, Distut to Tracy, somebody like that. Uh, I can give you the exact name, but uh, uh, who coined the term ideology, a uh, French thinker. Uh, but, you know, Marx really devoted quite a bit of attention uh, to ideology. But number two is not the only conception of ideology, even in Marx. And then if we talk about other thinkers then as well, uh, number one and number three can also be found there. And so in that sense, ideology refers to really the world of ideas, uh, human consciousness and texts, uh, religious beliefs, and uh, much of what we would call culture. Uh, so uh, this is also these three different definitions we can keep in mind as we, uh, as we discuss. By the way, Hal Bronner, uh, he viewed ideology basically in the number two sense. However, he did not view most ideological statements as intentionally seeking to deceive, right? It, 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 it's not, it, it, instead, Heilbronner's view of ideology is more along the lines of the ways that value judgments or biases can influence things like our choice of a research topic um, and you know what variables we decide to focus on um, and you know many other decisions that even the well-intentioned scientist or social scientist um, or any, you know, in any form of inquiry that, um, uh, that also, you know, can be the, the case as well. So a little economic history, um, you probably are familiar with European feudalism and uh, this social system and uh, type of organization of the political economic life um, emerged after the fall of the Roman Empire. And so it drew on some characteristics of both um, the ancient world or antiquity, you know, Greek and Roman, uh, ancient Greece and Rome, and the social organization and economic organization of the Germanic tribes, you know, the so-called barbarians. And in fact, in uh, the section of the Grundrisse, uh, which was um, Marx's uh, notebooks preparing to write capital, uh, but which came out uh, full uh, text in its English version only in 1973, has a section on pre-capitalist economic formations. And uh, Marx talks about ancient Greece and Rome, um, what he called the Asiatic mode of production, and then the Germanic mode of production which is sometimes uh, called the domestic mode of production so that we don't get confused about the name being indicative of only that geographic uh, location. So essentially uh, European feudalism, you've seen it in the movies, you know, it was a defensive 
a system that was protecting, but also in a sense, imprisoning the population. You had the lords and the serfs, and the serfs were hereditarily attached to the land. And three days a week, whatever they produced was for themselves and their family to subsist. And then three days a week, they whatever they produced went to the Lord as a tax or tribute. And then they had one day off. It, it, later, during the crisis of feudalism, uh, then actually they, they uh, serfs were starting, uh, forced to work half a day on Sunday as well. So it was a, um, agricultural subsistence based economy there was not a lot of trade going on during this uh, period and if you don't have a lot of trade then you don't uh, have a, a need for a lot of uh, money necessarily um and of course the political and economic units were very tiny so starting around 1300, there was a fall in agricultural production uh, from technological stagnation, uh, some bad weather, and then you had the Black Plague and you know all kinds. Of, it's, all that is uh, sort of referred to as the start of the crisis of feudalism. And so uh, in response to the pressure that the nobility put on the serfs to produce more uh, output, uh, there were a number of uprisings and serf rebellions. And so this, crisis of feudalism led these tiny uh, fractured sort of um, groups inhabiting what we now call Europe, right, to look outward. And so this is when they started sending ships out looking for uh, resources, uh, markets, uh, seeking trade and, you know, the age of discovery and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, you, you, you may know that uh, many of the technologies um, and the knowledge required to um navigate um or uh, even with defense and so on and so forth actually originated outside of europe but um europe adopted you know many of these whether it's you know gunpowder or the compass or you know mathematics and so on and they took advantage of the scientific gains i should say that there's several things that all start to occur around this same time period, let's say 1492 onward or 1500 onward, right? <laughs> so um, it, it uh, is not just a time when we are seeing the rise and development of capitalism, but also the new science and, you know, the European enlightenment and, uh, and uh, the age of reason and so on, right? So science was little by little taking over from the church, uh, a 
position of authority in terms of um, uh, evaluating truth claims. So, you know, before this, if someone wanted to argue that uh, the earth revolves around the sun, right? Or that, um, you know, or, or something like this, uh, it was the church that basically uh, decided whether that truth claim was valid or not. And so little by little, it was less the church and more and more uh, the new science. And um, so 1492, and of course, you know, we all learned uh, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but the, you know, so-called discovery of the so-called new world was not the only game-changing event that occurred. There's really like four important things that occurred, one of which was, you know, the perhaps accidental discovery of the Americas. Um, did you ever wonder why they speak Portuguese in Brazil, but the rest of South America speak Spanish? Well, the answer is the Papal Bull of 1492, 1493. So the, uh, with all these new discoveries going on, the Pope took a map of the world, drew a line down approximately the middle of it and declared the papal bull is a, a, a pope's declaration right um and so what you had was um the pope declaring that all the non-christian people and resources on one side of the line um, was he, he, he gave to uh, Spain and then on the other side, he gave to Portugal. And that line cut right down through South America so that Brazil was on the right side and then the rest of South America was on the left. So that's why they, uh, and then that's why, for example, there were a number of Portuguese colonies in Africa, but not really uh, any Spanish ones, except maybe a little bit um, uh, just across, you know, the um, waters from the Iberian Peninsula. But uh, and then on the other hand, Spain. Uh, was able to take many, you know, uh, territories, uh, for example, in the Pacific and, and so on, because that was on their side of the map. Also in 1492, the discovery of the sea route to India and Southern Asia around the Cape of Good Hope. In other words, um, European ships finally made it down to South Africa, around and up into the Indian Ocean and made their way to India. And we know what happens after that with uh, India becoming a colonial a colony of, um, of uh, Great Britain. So uh, this was hugely important, this discovery of the sea route, because prior to that time, trade between the three great agricultural civilizations of Europe, um, Sub-Saharan 
Africa and Southern Asia, trade between these three was all conducted over land and was controlled by the Arab world and later the Ottoman Empire. So by discovering the sea route, Europe was able to, so to speak, cut out the middleman, right? And then take over the trade with Southern Asia. And so the spice trade and then uh, textiles. And of course the opening of markets is uh, another aspect of it. And then the fourth thing that happened 1492 uh, is the defeat of the Moors at Granada. So uh, this, uh, you know, ended 700 years of Afro-Arab rule of the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, right? Um, and then uh, there was a new ruler in town and you had the Spanish Inquisition after that and um, so on and so forth. So these four things together were a huge impetus to uh, new resources, more land, um, uh, uh, new markets for uh, Europe's products. And as we'll see, a source for labor supply. So I don't know if you're familiar with the Williams Rodney thesis, uh, but it's really interesting. And Williams is Eric Williams, the former prime minister of Trinidad who uh, received his doctorate from Howard University and his dissertation became the book first published in 1944, Capitalism and Slavery. And then Rodney is the, uh, the historian Walter Rodney, who is from uh, Guyana, but uh, spent um, a good amount of his adult life in Tanzania in East Africa, and wrote several important books. The most well known is How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And then I'm also um, putting in here, uh, for reasons that I'll explain in a moment, uh, the Black Jacobans, CLR James, and Caste, Class, and Race by uh, Oliver C. Cox. So um, the reason that I put those two is that the elaboration of the Williams Rodney thesis has um, drawn on the arguments of these additional uh, scholars. So Eric Williams, his argument was that the uh, triangular trade, right? So uh, Europe would send ships down to West Africa and load them up with enslaved Africans, uh, go to the Americas where they would sell the slaves and then also um, load up with the uh, produce from the plantations where most of the enslaved African laborers were, uh, were working um, and then take those raw materials like sugar and cotton and you know uh, tea and coffee and tobacco and so on. I mean, it, it 
kind of seemed like a lot of these commodities were drugs in a way, right? I mean, sugar, coffee, tea, I guess not cotton, but tobacco. Um, and then Walter Rodney focused on the impact that the triangular trade had on Africa's traditional economy. And so there was a great disruption, uh, especially West Africa, but really the whole continent. And so Eric Williams focused on the impact of the triangular trade on the rise and development of capitalism in Europe. And then um, Rodney uh, focused on the impact of the same uh, triangular trade on the underdevelopment of uh, Africa. And CLR James, uh, he added uh, the piece that the uh, triangular trade um, uh, resulted in disproportionate rates of poverty uh, among the populations of African descent in the Americas, in the diaspora, if you will. And then Cox also added the ways in which the slave trade uh, resulted in the origins of modern racism. So uh, so according to the Williams Rodney thesis, uh, then you can outline these four impacts uh, majorly contributed to the rise of capitalism. This is controversial, not as much as it used to be, but um, you know, there's debates and whole literature, you know, about these things, you know, how important were these, you know, so-called external factors in the transition from feudalism to capitalism uh, relative to the internal to Europe uh, factors like class formation in you know European agriculture or whatever. And then the stunting of African economic development uh, and then poverty of Africans in the diaspora and the origins of uh, modern racism. So the rise of capitalism and the origins of modern racism, the rise of modern science, and we could even add in the uh, emergence of not patriarchy, because patriarchy certainly existed before capitalism, but it transformed patriarchy into a different form capitalism uh, did so that uh, we could call it capitalist patriarchy. So all of these resulting from uh, a set of historical developments. And uh, so, you know, the question is, are these different, and we can, by the way, add in uh, the exploitation of nature uh, as well, because you had, you know, it's the same group of thinkers, like Francis Bacon, for example, um, the idea of, you know, conquering uh, nature and taming nature and so on, and viewing humans as, you know, outside of, and in a sense, opposed to uh, nature. 
So um, with all of this proliferation of uh, international trade, uh, there arose in Europe a group of um, business people, government officials, uh, and so on, uh, who wrote little pamphlets trying to explain how foreign trade works to the nobility. And then they made certain arguments and, and uh, supported certain policies. And this is a time when the emergence of the modern nation state, the consolidation of a national identity, the reform of the state and its bureaucracy, all associated with this new era of global political economy. So as I say, um, mercantilists were not professional economists, certainly uh, I can't think of any, you know, academics or, but you did have merchants, uh, government officials, and uh, the period we're talking about is roughly, you know, 1500 to 1800, or really more specifically, kind of the middle of the 16th century until the early 18th uh, century. Now, all of these schools of economic thought, by the way, uh, so they do not, so if you were writing about political economy in this time period, you're not automatically a mercantilist. And same with, classical, neoclassical, right? It's not everyone who was in a certain time period. So um, there are uh, often people will get called, I don't want to say often, but sometimes people will get called a neo-mercantilist, you know, um, and a very famous mercantilist, uh, Frederick List, who was the one who came up with the infant industry hypothesis, which uh, argues that um, early on when an industry is just starting out in a country, it makes sense to have certain protections, right? So protectionism in the form of taxes and, uh, and, and so on um, is very much part of mercantilism. So the infant industry hypothesis argued that uh, early on in its development, an industry needs protection because it's not yet of the size where it's able to take advantage of um, the economies of scale and increasing returns that come with higher levels of output. And so, uh, so uh, at the beginning, an industry will need some protections, but once it gets big enough and its sales are large enough that it's able to compete with industries and other nations that are already you know, well-developed. So Frederick List, he was writing in, in the uh, early 19th century, I believe. And so, as I say, they wanted to explain the nature of commerce to the nobility, they wanted to influence government policy, especially on international trade, and if they could increase their personal 
wealth and power at the same time, and many mercantilists did. Uh, they didn't mind that at all. Um, you know, often uh, one individual would have all of these roles. Uh, as we'll see, Thomas Munn was, um, you know, a wealthy business person and a government official and, right, uh, author of uh, pamphlets and so on. Um, so they did not um, engage in uh, much abstraction, right? So the Mer you don't find really models so much in the mercantilists. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why they're not really considered a proper school of political economy. Um, and so some of the some of the focus um, that um, you know they were arguing that you know feudalism needs to be left behind because its organization is in is contradictory to um, uh, this consolidation of the modern nation state. And then you had uh, conflicts between the merchant class and the landed aristocracy. And this is gonna continue all the way up through Ricardo and Malthus um, with the conflicts between uh, capitalists and, and landlords, right? And so, you know, they did use reason, reasoned arguments, um, but not really much abstraction. And, um, but neither did they have the same form of reasoning as uh, prior writers on the economy, whether you go back to Aristotle, which is more philosophical and abstract, uh, or uh, people like Aquinas and St. Augustine, right, who were arguing, you know, from moral authority. And uh, by the way, I'm not going to talk much about John Locke. Um, because your professor wrote uh, one of the best articles on Locke's chapter on property and his argument for unlimited accumulation uh, in the second treatise on government. And so maybe she'll be you know, talking about that, if that uh, comes up. But, you know, one of the things about Locke is he says explicitly that he wants his uh, argument to be consistent with both revelation and reason. Revelation meaning he wants it to be consistent with the Bible and then reason. Right. So he's straddling between the the style of Aquinas arguing from moral authority and uh, influenced by Christianity and the newer science. And so instead of choosing one or the other, he said, well, I will make an argument that's consistent with both. Um, so let me give you an example uh, of a mercantilist uh, writing. Philip 
W. von Hornick, 1684. You can tell from the title, Austria over all, if only she will. Okay, so um, inspect the country's soil with the greatest of care. Use every clod of earth. Experiment with every plant. Spare no expense in discovering gold and silver. This is a quote. The, the, this whole this list is is all quoted because I wanted you to you know, get exactly the way he's going to say it. All commodities that cannot be found in their natural state should be produced within the country. Have as large a population as possible to increase the labor supply and have them be as, productible, as productive as possible. Gold and silver once in the country should not be let out for any reason. Do without foreign products to the greatest extent possible. If imports are required, trade goods for them, not gold or silver. Uh, some later mercantilists, of course, realized that gold and silver are commodities. And so they tried to explain to the king and to um, those who were criticizing uh, their views that uh, don't think of this as, you know, importing, let's say, cloth, think of it as exporting the commodity gold. So, uh, import goods in as unfinished form as possible and sell goods in as finished form as possible and as much as possible, find new markets. So, I mean, this, we have absolute documentation as far as, uh, you know, sugar instead of processing it in uh in the americas they would bring it back to europe and then they would refine it there and then they would get the molasses and they would make the rum and uh, so on and so forth so you get these um linkages right uh hirschman it just happens it's a completely different uh research line um he wrote on uh, latin american development and uh, hirschman is the one who sort of conceived of the ideas of backward and forward linkages it it, it it's not exactly the same as the keynesian multiplier but it has some family resemblances to it. So with sugar, a forward linkage would uh, be, you know, uh, chocolate and baked goods, anything that uses sugar as an ingredient. And then the backward linkages are the economic activity that is stimulated by the you know producing of the tools that are used in refining sugar uh you could even bring in you know the ships right and um and mercantilists did bring in uh the uh impact of um the enslavement uh, on all of, of, of this as well. Um, so uh, do not import something if there is a domestic supply. So he sums all these up by saying, be happy with your own goods. Don't buy foreign ones. Keep your gold and silver in your pockets. So basic policies of nationalism, self-sufficiency, and national power uh, adopted in varying degrees by uh, 
most, if not all, European nations. Another mercantilist, Thomas Munn, uh, he was the director of the British East India Company. So the British East India Company was, you know, getting criticism. This is what I was just uh, talking about, where people would just see ships being loaded with gold and sailing away. And so Munn argued, uh, you know, our wealth increases if we sell more to other countries than we buy back from them. In other words, net exports is what they call treasure or wealth. Okay. Um, so uh, this is where uh, Munn was able to use this argument that gold is a commodity like cotton or wheat. And so exchanging gold for other goods is not importing the other goods, it's exporting the commodity gold. The key is to sell more than you buy, right? Which of course, for the world as a whole, is not possible, right? Uh, so you have a zero sum game and, uh, and um, so uh, that's why we have to distinguish between wealth and wealth creation because sell more than you buy is not wealth creation because you know if there's two countries and i have a you know a trade surplus of 50 you have a trade deficit of 50 uh and uh, if i try to increase right this is the double entry bookkeeping and the importance of uh, accounting identities and, and so on. So uh, what's sometimes referred to as the mercantilist fallacy is the idea that, um, that uh, wealth can be created in the sphere of exchange as opposed to the sphere of production and uh and of course again it can never be true for the world as a whole it's a zero-sum game so um and then in the later mercantilist period they did turn some attention to the domestic economy because they realized that the domestic economy and international trade are connected. And in terms of the domestic policies, one position uh, they started taking was keeping wages low. So um, this, of course, you know, uh, wages are a cost for firms. And so uh, lower cost, higher profits, and so on. Um, but the weakness of the mercantilists, you know, was also just that they did not pay much attention to production. Uh, they focused almost exclusively on exchange. Uh, and so that was uh, one of the weaknesses. After the mercantilists came the physiocrats. I say after, uh, but you have, like I say, you know, some uh, 
some authors actually were writing during the mercantilist period, right? But their views were more consistent or closer to um, the physiocrats, uh, which increasingly now the physiocrats are being recognized as um, part of classical political economy before Adam Smith. And in fact, uh, Smith was very influenced by the physiocrats. He, he traveled to France. You might be familiar um, with the famous analysis of uh, the way production is organized in a pin factory at the beginning of the Wealth of Nations. And so uh, that was inspired by uh, a visit that Smith made. And he, he actually met Francois Cunet when he was in France. Uh, it was, uh, he, he did a visit to uh, not a pin factory, but something like that. And this is where he got the idea of, about the division of labor um, leading to higher productivity and so on. Um, now, physio of the physiocrats uh, refers to nature and the physiocrats, uh, they saw the agricultural sector as key and actually uh, capitalism in France uh, developed uh, first in the agricultural sector. And some of the names I mentioned, Cunet, Francois Cunet, Turgot, Mirabeau, but also for our purposes, we would include Cantillon and even William Petty as part of both the physiocrats and the overarching classical school of political economy. So Petty and Canet were both doctors, you know, physicians, and they had a fantastic analogy between blood and nutrients circulating through veins and arteries, right? Uh, and the circular flows of goods and money in the economy. And Canet actually created the Tableau Economica. And there are you see the X on the end, that means it's plural because there's not just one, he has a static and dynamic and you know switching around the assumptions or the variables. Uh, but this was like the first input output model and influenced uh, Marx's schemes of reproduction and even Leon Tief, the, the modern developer of input-output uh, analysis, uh, was familiar with and, and influenced by the physiocrats. It was a three-sector model. Um, and so the maybe number one thing about the physiocrats was that they recognized that the economy could produce a surplus of goods over and above just what it takes to keep the economy going at the same level. So, 
of course, in a capitalist economy, the surplus is called profits, right? Um, so for the physiocrats, the agricultural sector was the only sector that could produce a produit net, a net product or surplus. In fact, in their three sector model, the manufacturing sector is called the sterile sector. In other words, the value of inputs and the value of outputs are the same in manufacturing. But in agriculture, the value of output is greater than the value of the uh, inputs. And the uh, surplus in agriculture uh, and therefore the surplus in the economy uh, was viewed as rent. And then their policy proposals reflect their emphasis on agriculture. They wanted to uh, decrease or eliminate the tariffs, taxes, and other impediments to free or freer trade, especially in agricultural goods. And they also uh, had a proposal for a single tax on, on land, which is very similar to Henry George, the American economist um, from the 19th century. How are we doing on time? Uh, we end at 2.35, so. 2.35? Well, not our time. Oh, oh, okay. So, okay. <laughs> okay. So, all right. Um, I, I might, um, I'm going to try and leave a little time for questions or discussion. Um, so, the reason why the physiocrats are referred to as sort of the first school of political economy is you know, unlike the mercantilists, the physiocrats engaged in abstraction and model building, as did all the classical economists so, and Marx. So the, the overarching uh, goal in terms of their economic theory was to discover the laws of operation of capitalism, what Marx called laws of motion, right? Uh, and so they would focus on a few key variables and then they would abstract from other uh, influences and, and so they could derive some kinds of laws, right? Which in social science really means, you know, tendencies. Um, and with the, uh, with the Canet's tableau, then they viewed markets as interdependent and they focused on the conditions that have to be met for the economy to reproduce itself and grow, but you have to first reproduce yourself and that social reproduction, right, that entails uh, not uh, only, you know, producing enough food for the population, for example, but also the outputs in this period uh, 
have to include the inputs that were used up in production or depreciated. Uh, because, you know, if you don't replace the inputs that were used up, how are you going to eat next year, right? The, in order for the economy to be viable, you could say sustainable, right? Not just environmentally, includes environmental, but also, you know, economically sustainable. Then, um, like in a corn model, where the only output is corn, and it's produced with two inputs, abstracting from land for the moment, uh, labor and corn seed. And so the uh, the corn seed and the corn output are physically identical. And so you can find these kind of corn models in Petty, in Cantillon, in the Physiocrats, uh, in Ricardo's essay on profits, which he wrote before his principles. And so you find it you know, throughout the history of economic uh, thought. So Adam Smith was influenced by the physiocrats and like them, he argued against mercantilism and for free trade. But Smith not only saw the manufacturing sector as capable of producing a surplus profits, he saw manufacturing as the engine of capitalist development. So that was a great advance over the physiocrats to, um, to recognize as Smith did that a surplus can be produced uh, in manufacturing as well as agriculture or any sector, right? Uh, and the unit of analysis of all the classical authors uh, was economic class. All of the classical economists talk about the three three great classes of society, workers, capitalists, and landlords. Each one provides a different means of production, right? Workers provide labor, capitalists provide capital, and landlords provide land and natural resources. And each receives a remuneration that not only have a different names, but uh, there's a different logic to how their remuneration is determined. So workers earn wages, capitalists receive profits, and landlords uh, get rent, right? Um, so modern neoclassical economics doesn't take economic class or any social group as its unit of analysis. Instead, neoclassical economics uh, takes the individual individual household, individual firm as the unit of analysis. The very important implications of, you know, what a scientist or social scientist chooses as their unit of analysis. And many, many other similarities. Uh, for example, uh, the distinction between so-called natural prices and market prices. 
you find in Petty, Cantillon, Physiocrats, Smith, Ricardo, um, uh, Marx. Marx uh, also uh, had different name. Uh, he called the natural price prices of production. And then he also had labor values. So he had three uh, different levels um, in terms of um, price analysis. And then uh, the subsistence wage, not biological, but uh, socially determined subsistence. It's also found in all of these authors and many other many other uh, similarities as well. So Adam Smith is, is most well known, uh, first of all, the wealth of nations, um, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. The wealth of nations is the most famous work, but not his only work. And then in the Wealth of Nations, the, the passage and the idea that is uh, Smith is, is most known for is his idea that it is not from the benevolence of the butcher and the baker that we receive our uh, meat and bread, but rather from their self-interest. So uh, this is Smith's idea of the invisible hand, that people are led as if by an invisible hand, right? To So if self-interest, um, is considered to be maybe not the absolute, you know, worst if it's moderate, uh, worst part of people. Um, but nevertheless, a vice, right, would become a social or public virtue as if led by an invisible hand, right? Um, but Smith was not a professor of political economy. He was a professor of moral philosophy. And he wrote a book that he considered to be equally important as the wealth of nations. And Hal Bronner and, and some others have argued that you can't really understand the wealth of nations unless you also read the theory of moral sentiments because they're part of a, a Smith viewed uh, the theory of moral sentiments, the wealth of nations and a planned but not completed um, work on uh, jurisprudence, but we do have the lectures on jurisprudence. So that those three books was part of one life project. So what was the argument in the theory of moral sentiments? If you don't know this from before, you might be surprised that sympathy, which you know, modern psychology would call empathy was the social cement necessary for a well operating and, you know, good society or prosperous economy. Empathy, Adam Smith, right? Um, which is why. Sylvia Nasser a few years ago uh, wrote an article in the New York Times. She's the one who wrote the book that became the movie, A Beautiful Mind. Um, she had an article in the New York Times, Adam Smith ain't no Gordon Gecko. 
you know, from the movie Wall Street, the the first one, you know, uh, Gordon Gecko character, greed is good, right? Well, that is not what Adam Smith, he never argued greed is good in the way that uh, it was being instead moderate self-interest in the appropriate context and when it's accompanied by a sense of duty and a commitment to be socially responsible can under certain circumstances including a legal political framework right uh as well result in something that is socially welcome so uh that is a far cry from greed is good behaving in antisocial ways excessive greed is not consistent according to adam smith not consistent with a well operating uh society okay am i too late to hear any comments um that was terrific uh you're not too late at all so we have a question already okay, great. And, I, and i have a question okay gonna i'm post. gonna stop share so i can okay. see everybody perfect let me get the what is it yeah okay great okay well you want to call on them and i sure will yeah amanda yep amanda do you think it was a bit naive of Smith to assume that people will act in a moral way without the government having some say in it, because he proposed an entirely free market without any government intervention. Okay, so, um, so first, Smith did not propose, you know, no government. Uh, instead, government has its appropriate role, but it's true. He wanted, say, no more government than would be necessary, right? Um, but, you know, this third work that he didn't complete, but we have the lectures, and in addition to the you know, you can get a copy of the whole thing there. Halbronner um, put out something. It's called The Essential Adam Smith, and it includes excerpts from Fear of Moral Sentiments, uh, lectures on jurisprudence and the wealth of nations, and even a history of astronomy, which is not about astronomy. It, it's really Smith's method which is really fascinating. Um, but um, so, uh, so he did think that rules uh, of behavior and rules, you know, of conduct um, would evolve from free interaction of individuals in a community. Uh, so they're not being, you know, Smith in The Wealth of Nations was asking the question, how would a society that is freed from the constraints of feudalism and the church establish economic order right 
if everybody, you know, wasn't being told what to do by the Lord or uh, or by the church, what is right and what is wrong, then wouldn't it just be chaos and completely collapse and so on? So he wanted to make Smith in these works is not describing what he's seeing out his window. He's conducting a thought experiment in the fear of moral sentiments. It's how would a society that's freed from the constraints of the church in terms of uh, morality, you know, the church tells us what's right and what's wrong. Okay, if we don't have that, would we just collapse into a completely uh, terrible? And Smith argued that you start with just certain basics that, you know, are part of like human nature. And then through our interactions, then there develop or evolve these codes of conduct and that some of them will eventually be come laws but some will remain informal traditions right so you know for example um you know it might not be against the law for me to put my face one inch from your face and talk to you, but there is an unwritten rule that like, there's a certain amount of personal space we should respect. And there's many other things like this, right? Matt, uh, Professor, yeah. one last question in 60 seconds, we're gonna ask each of our speakers this question. Okay. Will you tell us whether you're a capitalist? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Right. So I am not a capitalist because I don't own the means of production. So, you know, that's, I remember when I was in their seats and the professor asked, you know, what's a worker? And somebody said, somebody who, who works with their hands. And he, the professor was like, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, workers do not own, you know, so we're intellectual workers. We have a nice lifestyle, you know, but um, we don't own the means of production. Therefore, you know, we can't be, a capitalist, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. So really terrific. Thank you. I'll Thank you. Great to see you all. Okay. And uh, hopefully, I'll come back sometime. We'd love to have you in person sometime. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. And take care. Enjoy the be rest. In of touch. Your day. All right. Yeah. Uh, you too. Have a good weekend. Uh, if I am anything, things going to be automatically safe in the system. Right? Good. I think. Oh, did we record to the cloud? Does it say to the cloud? It shows here the symbol of the cloud. Good. Yes. I haven't realized that. I know, like, we still have to.